Access Digital. They are America's future. Smart, tech savvy, and seemingly always connected. But what do we really know about today's young people? How are they different from previous generation? And what do they think about themselves and the world around them? To find out, we traveled across the country on a journey of discovery to listen and learn from Generation Next. Our generation's not scared to press buttons. Helping people is addictive. Our generation's a lot more open. We don't think things are a big deal. Sometimes I think what an honor it is to, to simply be born and live in this country. Traveling in our specially equipped RV, we crisscross the country, talking to hundreds of Gen Nexters, profiling some, and polling even more with the help of the Pew Research Center. While it's hard, if not impossible, to characterize an entire generation, in this second and final hour, you'll hear their unique perspective on such issues as sexuality, diversity, career, marriage, and family. I say that for sex. I say that for sex. We begin in San Diego. Does anybody want wine? At the home of John and Katie Fisk. They met in the dorm, first day, freshman year at San Diego State. And were married four years later, at the end of his first year in law school. He now works at a law firm while she teaches fourth grade at a largely immigrant charter school. You two seem to be sort of pr pretty together for your age. You're both, what, 23 years old. You're married. You're both working. You've both been to graduate school. You've been to law school. You have it together. How did that happen? You know, I'm not sure if we're more together. We have a nice appearance of being together because we decided to do all those things that our parents told us to do. Go to school, get through school early. We decided to be traditional and get married once we fell in love and wanted to get married. Traditional? Do the things our parents told us to do? Does anybody want white wine speak? While Gen Nexters may have more tattoos and piercings than their elders, they are not the rebellious youth of their parents' generation. William Strauss and Neil Howe have written several books about today's young people. The crime rate is down, teen pregnancies, teen births are at the lowest level ever measured. And this is the result of our society making a statement really back in the 80s when they started to be born. We wanted to raise a very, very different kind of generation that would behave better. One result of this parenting revolution is the unprecedented closeness Gen Nexters have to their families. We've never in the history of polling seen young people get along with their parents and vice versa as now. And, and one consequence of this mm. is, that, uh, is that their values tend to reflect what their parents have in mind. So they have relatively conventional values. Yeah, exactly. Still, there are important markers that distinguish Generation Next from their predecessors. John Fisk says his peers have learned from their parents' experiences and take a different approach to life and adulthood. Hello, John. How are you doing? Let's take work, for example. They look at their parents' lives and they think to themselves, my parents hate their jobs. Why would I want to try to commit to one thing my entire life and grumble about it for 40 years. Let's take marriage, for example. A lot of parents are divorced and their kids see their parents are divorced. Mm -hmm. Why would they jump into marriage if they think it's a horrible thing? If that's the case, why'd you do it? To be honest, I fell in love really fast and at heart, I'm a huge nerd. And <laughs> I loved being in school and I did want to start a career early just because I enjoy the law. Anybody who is around young people in the workplace or in college is struck by, by how confident they are about their own abilities and about their own future. They feel a lot of stress, feel very pressured. So the time 
uh, is just not enough for them to to get done everything they they want to get done. What kind of stress are you talking about? That we go through? Oh Lord! <laughs> <laughs> How long is the interview? <laughs> For me, it's the fact that I tried to fit absolutely everything on my plate all at once, whereas some people start to spread it out throughout their lifetime, throughout their 20s. Being a new associate at the firm is very stressful. We now have a mortgage that we have to pay. Uh, we want to have kids someday, so we want to get everything in order by, by the time we want to have kids. Time for the voice of the next generation. For the next three hours, you're going to have to talk and talk and talk. And we're going to have fun tonight. Are you ready for this? No. I'm actually going to set an age limit for Why? this show. Why would you what through <laughs> Monkey Wrench and the Gears, I then added on the radio show. And that added so much stress to the point where we see each other a half an hour in the morning, and a half an hour at night in between Monday and Friday. If that. For thousands of years, sports was often a mirror of what was happening in society. Sports reflected who we were, gave us heroes to cheer for, and opponents to fear. Sports reporters' descriptions, analysis, and images of victory or defeat become ingrained in our memories resonating inside us at the mere mention of an event. The history of sports reporting is fascinating and sometimes controversial. Welcome to the Press Box. Great sports moments are etched in our memories forever. Lewis for the old one two. This is gonna be a home run. I don't believe what I just saw. Witnessed and recorded by teams of sports reporters. But why are sports so compelling? So important that we can't wait to go online, surf for TV highlights and commentary. Let's wrong, see what happens. Wrong, wrong, Let's wrong, 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 wrong. Or open up the morning newspaper to find out what happened. Sometimes the issues and the personalities surrounding sports transcend the specific events. It's a world now, and, and sports is a big part of it, where personalities drive the news. It's almost as if fans see themselves in their sports team. To that end, I think the responsibility of a sports reporter is a crucial one. All right, had a 4-2 lead for the Bombers as we head to the seventh. Inning. 1800s into the 1900s, only had three major sports. Baseball, then spelled with two words, horse racing and boxing. In 1908, the flamboyant Jack Johnson became the first African-American to win boxing's heavyweight title. The press called for retired champion Jim Jeffries to get back in the ring. They called him the white man's hope. We really were in a segregated society. And what the press did with that was headlines, you would have thought World War I was four years earlier than when it started, because it was a war, a race war, played with newspapers. Johnson defeated Jeffries in a one-sided fight. It sparked riots across the country. To prevent further violence, Congress passed a law that, in effect, banned fight films from America's movie screens for nearly 30 years. I saw Sonny Liston a few days ago, Jack. Ain't he ugly? <laughs> he's, he's too ugly to be the world's champ. The world's champ should be pretty like me. 
He was the mouth that roars, the Louisville lip. Clay comes out to meet Liston, and Liston starts to retreat. If Liston goes back to his father, he'll end up in the ringside seat. He knew how to exploit the press. Muhammad Ali comes along at uh, the juncture of old-time sports and the changing of the guard. They might be stopping it. That might be all, ladies and gentlemen. Many of the writers and broadcasters were people who would cut their teeth prior to the Depression, or certainly right at or just after World War II. So their view of sports was old school. At the same time, there was a new group of reporters who loved sports and the drama of it and had an appreciation of the history of it, but also saw the cultural issues involved. They saw race. They saw the challenging of the establishment. They saw the turmoil over the war in Vietnam. How you felt about Muhammad Ali was a litmus test as to whether you were part of the establishment or you were part of the new guard.